to start, sir? Uh, yeah, I think we'll keep up time because yesterday uh, it, it was a very interactive and enthusiastic uh, session that went till 9.30. So today, I think we'll start on time or it's 96 now. Participants who are in. I think we should start. We'll start. Uh, Vinash. Yeah, I think we should start. If Dr. Arun is fine to start. Because okay. People tend to join here. Yes, uh, I think we'll start then. Ajay, go ahead. So, uh, good evening, everyone. The talk is about to begin. So, there's some guidelines we hope you adhere to. The first and the most important guideline here is that all the mics should be on mute. This is to ensure that the talk proceeds without any distractions. Uh, the second is that the participants who are attending this webinar from YouTube and Instagram, they should type their names in the comments and their names and the institutions in the comments. This is to enable us to verify their participation. The third guideline is that after the talk, the participants using uh, Microsoft Teams can ask their doubts by using by using the raise your hand option. And our moderator, uh, Dr. Viola, will communicate your names to the speaker during the Q&A session, where you can unmute yourself one by one and ask your questions. And uh, simultaneously, during the uh, Q&A session, those who are streaming this webinar from Instagram and YouTube can type their questions in the comments, and our moderator will communicate your questions. And uh, now I request uh, Jeffin to introduce the speaker. Over to Jeffin. Jeffin, you oh, Am I audible? You. Yes, yes. Yeah, over to Jeffin. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, a very good evening to each and everyone present. Uh, my name is Jeffin, and I'm here to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Aisha Arun. Dr. Aisha Arun, Director of Research and Veterinary Operation, has been working with Wildlife SOS since 2003. As a part of Wildlife SOS team, Dr. Arun has led rescue team and rehabilitated and treated wildlife such as slot bears, leopards, elephant, tigers, and many more. He was a TEDx MEC 2019 speaker. His hard work and dedication has not only earned him awards like Governor's Award for the Best MVSC Student of Wildlife Science and the Best Emerging Wildlife Veterinarian. Dr. Ar Dr. Arun proudly holds the member in IUCN SSC Beer Specialist Group, BSG, for Slot Beers Lifetime Membership with Association of Indian Zoo and Wildlife Veterinarian. For his binding work in research and publication, he has been part of over 18 international publications and over 81 national publications. We are so glad and privileged to have you here, sir. Over to you, Dr. Arun. Over to you, sir. Uh, a very warm good evening to all of you. Hope everyone is safe and uh, at home. Uh, uh, as uh, he was uh, mentioning, uh, uh, first of all, thanks for a wonderful introduction. Uh, basically, I'm a wildlife vet uh, looking after wild animals and involved in uh, rescue and rehabilitation procedures for the last uh, uh, 16, 17 years. So I'm uh, going to get into the title. Uh, is my screen visible to all of you? No, sir. Just a minute. Is it now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really would like to uh, thank uh, St. Joseph's College Zoology uh, Department and uh, especially uh, Arusha India, uh, Mr. Avinash, uh, for giving me the wonderful opportunity to address in this national webinar on wildlife trafficking and zoonosis. So it's really a, a pleasure and then privilege for me to hear and then discuss with all of you. And uh, I know that zoonotic disease is a, not a small uh, topic, so I would always uh, recommend that please be little attentive and then if there is any uh, queries, then we can always discuss and then uh, let us uh, learn about this zoonotic disease or uh, refresh our knowledge because I'm sure that all of you must have gone through all these zoonotic diseases in your graduate and undergraduate or postgraduate level. 
So I'm going to give you some glimpse of this uh, zoonotic disease uh, and with respect to uh, COVID-19 uh, in specific. Okay, so unfortunately I have to talk about zoonosis and its origin and history. Uh, as you all know that zoonosis is derived from a Greek word and zoom is animal and noson is disease. And zoonosis was coined by uh, Rodolphe uh, Virchow, who was defining it for communicable diseases. So uh, diseases and infection which are naturally transmitted between vertebrate animal and humans uh, was coined by uh, World Health Organization in 1959. So some examples are like rabies, avian influenza, Japanese encephalitis, leptospirosis, plague and anthrax. So I would really wanted to uh, talk to you about emerging zoonosis because this term is also important because it's nothing but a zoonosis that is newly recognized or newly evolved or that has occurred previously but shows an increase in incidence or expansion in geographical host or vector range so which was jointly uh, 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 constituted by WHO, FAO and OIE in the year 2004. So out of this 1,415 microbial diseases, almost 61 percentage are zoonotic and within that 13 percentage species regarded as emerging or re-emerging. For example, swine flu, bovine spongiform encephalitis, NIFA, avian influenza, ANSA virus in USA. Is the screen visible to everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah. Again, the other term that we all have to go through is neglected zoonosis. The vast majority of the zoonosis are, but however, not prioritized by health system at national and international level and are labeled neglected. But they are, again, a very important zoonosis uh, 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 infection. <laughs> Examples, bovine tuberculosis and even human tuberculosis, brucellosis, leishmaniasis, cysticercosis and echinococcosis. So here you can very well uh, visualize the pie diagram, which is about human livestock and wildlife, and the interaction between these three uh, uh, organisms. And as you all know that the disease is primarily between these three. One is host, the other one is uh, disease, <laughs> is environment. Is my line clear? Hi. Yes. Can I continue? Yes, sir, please. Uh, yeah. One minute. Uh, I, we request all the participants to mute their mic uh, so that there is active participation. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Proceed, sir. Not an issue. So, these three components we should really understand. One is host, the other one is environment, the other one is pathogen. So, when we talk about all these three, there will be a very good a relation between the wildlife was, uh, sorry wildlife and the zoonosis because the wildlife host species richness is a significant predictor of the emergence of zoonotic EID. EID is nothing but emerging infectious disease with a wildlife origin with no role for human population growth, latitude and rainfall. On the other side, we have the same zoonotic EIDs from non-human, I mean non-wildlife host is predicted by human population density human population, growth, latitude, and not by wildlife host species richness. So these are very important points that we should keep it in mind when we are talking about wildlife and zoonosis. Here, I would like to share some of the zoonotic diseases contribution over years, I mean, uh, centuries from uh, 1940 till 2000. You can very well see the unspecified zoonoses are very little and zoonotic with respect to non-wildlife is uh, red in color. And you can see the wildlife contributed zoonotics are really, really uh, uh, more. I mean, uh, we can very well say that the contribution of uh, wildlife to the zoonotic is really more as per this uh, 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 publication of John Settle in 2008. 
And anyway, we will have to go through all this classification of zoonosis. As you all know, zoonosis is classified based on several parameters or several uh, factors. So the first one is according to the etiological agent, which is nothing but bacterial zoonosis, viral zoonosis, rickett shell, protozoal, helminthic, fungal, and ectoparasites. And you can see uh, multiple examples on each etiological agents. Anyway, I'll uh, come into those separately. And based on the reservoir host, the zoonosis is classified into three major categories. One is anthropozoonosis, which is nothing but the disease from animals to lower, uh, I mean, uh, lower uh, vertebrate animals to uh, people. Example, brucellosis, uh, arboviral infection, leptospirosis, Q fever. And zoo anthroponosis is from man to lower vertebrate animals. Uh, those are like streptococci, staphylococci, diphtheria, enterobacteriaceae, human tuberculosis in cattle and parrots. And amphizoonosis is nothing but either direction it will be passing from lower vertebrate to human or human to lower vertebrate. And according to the mode of trans transmission, the, cl uh, the classification of uh, zoonosis is four different types. Direct zoonosis is by direct contact. So the an infected vertebrate host and examples are anthrax, brucellosis, leptospirosis and toxoplasmosis and uh, uh, cyclozoonosis and our COVID-19 is coming into direct zoonosis so it can spread through direct contact or by any fomites. So the cyclozoonosis require more than one vertebrate host but no invertebrate host for the completion of the life cycle of the agent. So for example, echinococcosis and teniosis. These are all parasitic uh, zoonosis. And metazoonosis is nothing but transmitted biologically by invertebrate vector. And an important factor here is it always needs an extrinsic incubation period before transmission, which is otherwise known as pre-patent time. So only then it can uh, affect another uh, vertebrate host. Example, plague, cystosomiasis, arboviral infection, and leishmaniasis. And the saprozoonosis always require a vertebrate host under non-animal developmental site like soil, plant material, pigeon droppings, uh, etc. For, for development of this infectious agent, example, aspergillosis, coccidiosis. Uh, So this is very important because the factors influencing the emergence of zoonotic disease is really, really uh, um, a key factor to understand about the zoonotic diseases. So it's based on the ecological, etiological changes in the environment and agricultural operations. Uh, uh, for example, uh, leptospirosis, plague, Rift Valley fever, uh, KFD are all uh, based on environmental and agricultural operation and increased movement or traveling uh, by people. Example, amoebiosis, giardiosis, polybacillosis, etc. And handling of animal byproducts and waste. So, a very good example is anthrax and uh, chlamydiosis, salmonellosis and bird flu, etc. And the other uh, influencing factor is increase in density of animal population, dermatophytosis and tuberculosis. Increased congregation of any animal population which are already carrying the zoonotic problem are very potential factor influencing the zoonotic disease. And pathogen changes like genetic uh, shift or drift. I mean, uh, when, when the uh, infective material from the body makes multiple copies, sometimes it creates copying error in simpler sense. So that is otherwise known as genetic shift or drift. So influenza, E. coli and cephalococcus are coming under uh, this pathogen changes. So the transmission type, again, it's a critical uh, part to understand. The transmission type is really, really uh, 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 an important uh, uh, area to understand about the zoonotic disease. Uh, and it has got five different stages, stage one to five. And stage one is agent only in animals. So there won't be any transmission to human being. You can just concentrate on the left side of the slide on the right extreme side of the slide. So stage two, it's a primary infection. From animal, it goes to another human being or to an animal. So that is 
only from animal. So that is stage two. And stage three is a limited outbreak. It's only from animal, a few cycle of humans. You can see in the picture, monkey to human and human to another human might be possible. It's not definite. So it's it sometimes get contained in few cycles uh, within the uh, uh, species. And the fourth stage is long outbreak because it has got many cycles uh, from animal or in human. So animal to uh, people, people to people, people to people. So it goes into many cycles. So that is the transmission to human. Uh, and uh, stage five is exclusive human agent. So it's only from human to human. So uh, that is why this transmission type is also very important for us to understand the uh, uh, zoonosis. And hotspots of zoonotic diseases. So, as we all know that emerging infectious disease events are dominated by zoonosis. And almost 60 percentage, I mean 60.3 percentage, are is very dominated by zoonosis among all the emerging infectious diseases. And the majority of these, 71.8 percentage out of 60.3, originate in wildlife. And apart from this, these emerging disease hotspots are primarily from or concentrated in lower latitude developing countries. You can very well uh, appreciate that in the map. Wherever it was uh, uh, dark red in color and the minor yellows are really the uh, lower latitude developing countries and they are very uh, prone and uh, rich in uh, hotspots of these zoonotic diseases. So we all always blame wildlife or many of our known uh, direct zoonosis are from uh, human origin, sorry, wildlife origin, uh, that too, uh, primarily from bats and few other intermediate hosts, but still, we should always uh, keep uh, Charles Darwin's theory that uh, the pathogens evolves like species. So, uh, there is always a 50-50 percentage chance that even the microbes or the pathogens evolve and uh, uh, taken over uh, the uh, mankind and then start uh, uh, giving a zoonotic uh, infection. These are some of the top zoonotic outbreaks in India. Uh, as you all aware, uh, probably uh, pneumonic plague uh, in Surat uh, was uh, um, recorded in 1994, and cholera outbreak in 2001 in Orissa, almost 33 uh, 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 people died. And 2006, dengue outbreak was uh, uh, become a very major issue and 3,600 plus cases were uh, uh, recorded and uh, 50 people have uh, uh, died. And in bird flu in West Bengal uh, in the year 2008 was also uh, created a major uh, uh, havoc. And in 2009, swine flu, almost 503 deaths all over India. And in 2005, again, the same uh, the swine flu outbreak happened in 2018, uh, deaths were recorded. And in 2018, the virus outbreak in Kerala, almost 17 people have died. So coming to the risk factors for zoonotic disease emergence is primarily classified into three major headings of social, ecological, and microbial. So in social, these are very important uh, 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 factors or examples that human behavior, even the uh, self hygiene and then our uh, uh, cultural uh, activities, whatever it is, it's all based on uh, human behavior and mobility, movement between uh, the same uh, town or outside the town, between uh, district or between state or between the country. So that's a mobility and demography and public health measures. So whatever the public health measures we have taken, it all uh, comes under social. And in ecological, animal contacts, agricultural practices, fisheries, environmental pollution, global warming are primarily uh, considered under ecological uh, uh, risk factor. And the last one is the microbial, as I already said, mutation and recombination or reassortments uh, re or the, the microbial uh, risk factors uh, for uh, zoonotic disease emergence. So this was an interesting information. I was actually going through one uh, Ms. Mindy Sampson's uh, uh, 
we're talking xenosis and globalization and there was a global flight map was made on a particular day on a saturday a random day was chosen and at 8 30 a.m the statics uh, statistics were uh, uh, established and then they found uh, 10,000 flights a day was recorded and almost 36.8 million flights occurred in 2017. Can you imagine that in a day, if 10,000 flights are flying over and then 36.8 million flights in a year, you don't need to uh, expect any disease from any corner of the globe. So it happens like this because we have commute between countries and uh, the air traffic control is amazing. I mean, I don't know how uh, the engineers are able to make sure that this uh, uh, traffic is maintained without uh, uh, troubling the uh, flights in between and able to manage uh, uh, takeoff and landing, all those things. But 38.8 million flight occurred in one year is a really mind-blowing fact. So uh, we have to be very, very uh, proactive that how are we going to deal with this kind of uh, pandemic? And these are some of the very uh, reputed and uh, known uh, zoonotic disease research organizations so starting from World Health Organization, Public Health Foundation of India, ICR, ICMR, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Wildlife Institute of India, OIE, National Institute of Communicable Disease. So these are some of the uh, few to name. So I'm going to get into coronaviruses directly before I deal with other uh, uh, zoonotic diseases because uh, I feel because of the time constraint I, I should definitely interact more about coronavirus than the other zoonoses. As you all know coronavirus COV are a large family of viruses that causes illness ranging from a common cold uh, and a disease like uh, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. SARS-CoV was recognized in November 2002 again in China and MERS is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012 in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so this novel coronavirus of zoonotic origin means this disease spread by human to human, sorry, by animal to human. Outbreaks in healthcare workers indicate human to human transmission was also possible and it was very well evident in uh, uh, this COVID-19 case. So the name was coined by WHO on 11th March and uh, uh, short form of COVID stands for CO is Corona and VI is virus and D is a disease that we every uh, one aware of. So it's a new strain and has not been previously identified in humans. The first person infected in Wuhan, Hubei in China on 17th November 2009 and has gone to affect over 425,000 people in over 150 countries around the globe, causing more than 18,000 18,000 uh, deaths. So that was a, a very old uh, recent statistics later. The outbreak was declared a public health emergency of international concern on 7, 13th, uh, 30th Jan 2020 and it was declared as pandemic on 11th March 2020. And in India, the first patient found in Kerala on 30th Jan 2020 oh, affected, uh, had a travel history from one China. Uh, he was a medical student from China, Wuhan especially. So this virus can cause pneumonia-like symptom, and I will talk to you about the uh, symptoms in uh, uh, upcoming slides, but it leads to a lot of breathing difficulties and can cause organ failure and eventually uh, mortality. And uh, as you all know, antibiotics are specific to bacteria, and no virus can be killed by an antibiotic. So antibiotics are of no use. And the other important structural uh, protein, this is spike glycoprotein, is a very creative architecture. And it is a key player of viral entry into the host, as well as producing vaccine design by using this uh, blueprint. Cause of the causes of uh, COVID-19. So this zoonotic infection first developed in animal before developing in humans. For the virus to pass from animal to human, a person has to come into close contact with an animal that carries the infection. So this is how we, we thought the infection might have been uh, come from the animal. But this was very early stage. Once a virus develops in people, 
coronavirus can transmit it from person to person through respiratory droplets, which is nothing but a wet stuff that moves through the air when you cough or sneeze or talk. So the viral material hangs out in these droplets and can breathe into the respiratory tract where the virus can then lead to an infection. In 2019, coronavirus has then been definitely linked to a specific animal. But the researchers believe that it may have been passed from bats to another animal, either snakes or pangolin, and then transmitted to human. Because it is must that these lower vertebrates will definitely have an intermediate post to uh, transmit the disease to humans. So the transmission likely occurred in the open foot market, which is wet wet market in Wuhan, China. These are major uh, symptoms. It might appear between 2 to 14 days after exposure. Cough, fever, headache, headache loss of taste or smell, repeated shaking with chills, sore throat, shortness of breath and muscle pain. So how are coronavirus diagnosed? As we all know that, the diagnosis similarly to other conditions uh, uh, by any viral infection using blood or saliva or tissue sample. But uh, in most tests, uh, use a cotton swab uh, retrieved uh, from inside the nostril and then uh, by doing some uh, 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 biotechnological or uh, molecular diagnosis, it's very easy to diagnose the disease. And there are multiple uh, tests available, PCR based, nothing but uh, uh, anti uh, body based or antigen based to test or serology and thermal detectors. As I already said, prophylaxis and treatment is nothing as on now. So currently no medications and no cure. Antibiotics, as I said, is not effective against viral. And researchers are still uh, testing a variety of possible treatments to get away with COVID-19. But FDA granted permission for some medications used for some other diseases. And if the uh, condition is very severe, if there is no other options, we can go for this uh, two primary drugs called the two anti-malarial drugs, hydrochloroquine and chloroquine, and the antiviral drug, uh, Remdesivir and a combination of uh, several other antiviral diseases. Because this is, uh, it's, it's, I mean, uh, if you're talking about this anti-malarial drug, it is not a direct effect of this hydrochloroquine uh, against this virus. It's a kind of an uh, uh, additional effect. So that is why, uh, since we don't have any specific drug for this, so uh, FDA approved permission to use uh, any of these anti-malarial or uh, uh, anti-viral drugs uh, if the infection is very severe, not in all cases. Prevalence, this is today's statistics, continuing its spread across the world with more than 73.818 lakh confirmed cases in 188 countries and more than 4,13,648 people have lost their lives. This is again today's statistics. So these are some of the mode of transmission. As we all know, sneezing or coughing by infected person, the droplets uh, uh, will be passed on to your any of the body parts. And then uh, when you touch or uh, touch any surfaces, you will uh, get the virus. I mean, this is how we contract the uh, diseases. And if it is not by direct contact, the other version is touching any fomites. I mean, if the droplets are uh, 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 spilled over any other inanimate objects or handles or uh, doors, uh, 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 knobs, whatever it is, so that uh, infected droplets get onto your hand and then again the virus uh, gets transferred into your uh, respiratory system. So then how to prevent this COVID-19? So this is basically uh, an information provided by WHO and it's very easy that to understand the basic psychosocial skills, a guide for COVID-19 response. So, so it's, it's actually uh, protecting yourself and in a very methodical way. Wash your hands frequently, maintain social distancing, avoid touching eyes and nose, mouth frequently, practice respiratory hygiene. If you have fever, cough and difficulty in breathing, seek medical care early. Stay informed and follow advice given by your healthcare provider. So that's very easy by using the government uh, created an app called uh, Arugya Setu. So uh, I would uh, strongly recommend that please download this app and then uh, be very active and then attentive to this uh, app and then you can easily 
uh, follow the problems around you and then they will be also monitoring you and that is what the government is trying to do and achieve so we will all have to extend our cooperation uh, for this uh, pandemic and your lifeline says wash your hands so these are some of the don'ts like uh, don't use other ways of covering your face like i mean uh, uh, the ladies used to use their pallu the sari or uh, chani or the gamcha to cover their face so this is not the way to do the uh, uh, masking procedure so don't touch your eyes nose as i already mentioned so don't touch the surfaces like door knobs door bells elevator buttons uh, handrails support handles chair back surface atm mobiles gym handles so try to avoid all these inanimate objects or uh, always sanitize your uh, uh, hands spit in open don't spit in open always use a Uh, spit on or wash basin for spitting. Don't hold events where people have to gather. Even it is a corner meeting with three or four friends, or an evening chat, or on a, uh, a chow hall. So please never uh, uh, create any uh, gatherings. So uh, don't go to a crowded place like markets, shopping, uh, uh, melas, parties, malls, whatever it is, and don't use public transport as much as possible. these are some of the high risk groups like as you all know that elderly people more than 60 years or very uh, tiny infants or uh, at high risk and people with uh, decreased immunity and people with comorbidities such as diabetes hypertension kidney diseases so all this uh, act as a, a risk factor uh, to um, contract the disease and there is a major difference between the isolation and quarantine i just wanted to throw some light on it so the isolation is if you are sick and isolation period is at least 7 days so separate sick people with a contagious disease from people who are not risk who are not sick and you must stay away from others uh, from at least 7 days after your symptoms have gone away so on the other hand quarantine is if you are exposed so separates people from people and restrict their movement if they were exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick for people who are not sick but they have been exposed in close contact with someone who is sick you must stay away from others for 7 14 days uh, and see if you get sick and there is one other funny fact i was actually uh, uh, observing that in march when there was very less corona fear factor was so much so it actually worked a lot and in june i could see this change in behavior of people that corona is really on another side or upper side and people have lost their fear people are going everywhere and some of them when when they are seeing some officials or authorities you only they are putting the mask as as if they are actually protecting uh, uh, the uh, public or police people so they they won't understand the impact of the mask and then the personal hygiene so i would really insist uh, all of you and your friends and families insist and then please make them aware that what kind of pandemic uh, we are dealing with so it's it's really a tough time for everyone but still there are ways and means to get away with it but we can't take it granted so please be aware of it and there are a lot of myth busters i don't need to go into individuals but to just uh, uh, tell you few cold weather and snow cannot kill the Uh, new coronavirus and the new coronavirus cannot be transmitted through mosquito bites hand dryer is effective in killing the new coronavirus so there is no evidence that companion animals or pets such as dogs or cats can transmitted the uh, coronavirus ultraviolet light should not be used to for sterilization and can cause skin irritation so these are all the myths that people are uh, thinking that these all will get away but these are all the facts so what was given here is a fact so this is the myth buster and this was a interesting article uh, i was recently uh, uh, going through and uh, this is a very interesting and uh, uh, publication done by uh, us i mean uh, university of california san diego uh, san francisco and uh, uh if if you anybody uh, i mean if you are interested in uh, going through the picture i am happy to share the pdf form but still if you have the uh, title of the paper then you can very well uh, uh, download it from uh, google 
So according to the paper and the annexure provided in this paper, I'll give you the glimpse. The very high risk factors are with human chimpanzees and rhesus macaque. And the high uh, risk of um, uh, contracting the disease is uh, in uh, reindeer and dolphin. And uh, medium risk animals are leopard, tiger and cheetah, hamster, cattle, water buffalo, goat, sheep and cat. The low risk uh, animals are especially bears, rhinoceros, elephant, flying fox, panda, camel, donkey, horse, dog and pig. And very low uh, risk uh, animals are categorized uh, into palm civet, fruit bats and rats, guinea pig and mouse. So now I'm getting into a major uh, uh, portion of the other uh, zoonotic diseases in the globe. Rabies, as you all know, it's a highly fatal viral disease. In India, rabies account to about 20,000 deaths annually. Most animal bites in India, 91.5% are by dog, or which are about 60% are strays and 40% are pets. So rabies is present throughout the country, except in islands like um, uh, Andaman, Nicobar, so all those places. And incubation period is between three to eight weeks, and vaccinations are very much available for controlling of rabies and the World Rabies Day was uh, celebrated in September 28. Tuberculosis is in human, the most commonly caused by, uh, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, a slow growing waxy rod shaped tuberculin, a mac, uh, sorry, uh, bacterium uh, transmitted primarily via the air when an infected individual coughs or sneezes. It estimated that uh, one third of the world is infected with this agent, which causes approximately 2 million deaths every year. Though most infections are asymptomatic, infection is becoming increasingly deadly due to both the spread of a highly antibiotic resistant strains like uh, XTBs and uh, HDR. So these are all like uh, drug resistant uh, uh, tuberculosis and they're increasing in numbers with both HIV and uh, TB has become a major concern. The other uh, zoonotic disease is brucellosis. It's also called Banks disease, Crimean fever. There are multiple names for it, Mediterranean fever, rock fever, undulant fever. So it's caused by uh, Bacillus uh, militensis, the brucella, brucella militensis or brucella abortus and brucella suis and brucella canis. So it depends on the species it affects. And most human infections are caused by brucella militensis uh, in India. It's highly contagious zoonosis caused by ingestion of unsterilized or unpasteurized uh, uh, milk and the meat of infected animal or close contact with secretions. So clinical findings are acute uh, brucellosis, prolonged uh, bacteremia, irregular fever, chills, muscular uh, articular pain, drenching sweats, exhaustion, anorexia. So I don't want to deal with the clinical findings here. And chronic brucellosis have sweating uh, lassitude, uh, joint pains with uh, minimal or no fever. Plague is another deadly infectious disease that is caused by Enterobacteria Essenia pestis, an ancient disease and has caused three pandemics in 6th century. India, in India, fatal outbreak in 1994 happened in Maharashtra and in 2002 it happened in Simla. Transmitted by black rat, ratus ratus and oriental rat flea. Transmission by droplet contact again, direct physical contact by soil contamination, airborne transmission, fecal oral transmission, uh, uh, etc. Anthrax is another uh, uh, bacterial disease caused by Bacillus anthracis, oldest recorded disease of animals. Human acquired infection from cattle, sheep, goat, horses, and swine. Anthrax is enzootic in southern India, but it is less frequent in. Uh, northern uh, uh, states of India. Anthrax in sheep is prevalent in uh, uh, sheep in Andhra, Tamil Nadu border, causing cutaneous or meningoencephalitic human infections with a high mortality rate. Outbreaks of anthrax is a ever continuing process in Mysore. It happened in 1999, Odisha 2004 and 5, in West Bengal 2000. So it, it happens uh, uh, routinely, but at least it is uh, known as enzootic uh, in uh, southern India. And based on the root of infection, there are three clinical types or established. One is cutaneous uh, anthrax, which you can see on the uh, picture. And on the other side, it's a 
pulmonary anthrax occurs due to inhalation and the intestinal form is if you are improperly cooked uh, uh, meat is consumed then you will have a violent enteritis with bloody diarrhea so that's a intestinal form of anthrax leptospirosis is an emerging global public health problem caused by leptospira intragens naturally seen in rodents endemic in andaman island and southern states of india uh, particularly kerala uh, tamil nadu gujarat karnataka and maharashtra rodents and domestic and wild animals uh, form the reservoir of infection they will never show any symptoms so they are otherwise known as reservoir host and they will never establish any symptoms so it's a kind of uh, quiet host and they resolve the uh, uh, pathogen so domestic animals such as cattle dog and pig may act as temporary carrier and rodents are permanent carriers and the other important uh, uh, zoonosis is rickettsial infections they cause irreversible damage to the human host associated with high morbid morbidity and mortality mortality rate can be as high as 20 to 50 percentage prevalent in jammu and kashmir himachal pradesh maharashtra uttaranchal assam kerala and tamil nadu the zoonotic uh, disease considered important in india are epidemic typhus murine typhus scrub typhus and these causative agents are uh, uh, different kinds of ticks so this kfd is kashnor forest disease is a viral hemorrhagic fever first reported in karnataka in 1957 in the wild the virus resides in their reservoir host like mice porcupine and shrews again they act as a reservoir host monkeys are considered as amplifying host ticks are vectors so these ticks carry this uh, infection when it was getting amplified in monkey and uh, at one point of time they found uh, a series of monkeys mortality and that is when the disease was uh, investigated and identified and annually an average of 500 cases are reported in human beings and 3 to 10 percentage is the mortality rate malaria this is a recently discovered the zoonotic potential of plasmodium species there are more i mean four major uh, plasmodium species are causing human malaria and it is uh, as we all know that transmits between uh, human Uh, by uh, mosquitoes uh, a species called anopheles the recent discovery of plasmodium nalosi typically infect forest macaque and the disease can be transmitted to human and it is easy to diagnose with a, uh, a blood smear and it is very easily uh, uh, visible even on the picture you can see the rbc with the dark uh, stain uh, particles or plasmodium species so the other uh, group of uh, viral diseases are called orboviral diseases uh, which includes japanese encephalitis it's a, it's a, a virus uh, transmitted disease through zoonotic cycle between mosquitoes pigs and water birds uh, keeping the uh, culex as vector and dengue uh, virus is uh, again transmitted by aedes aegypti Uh, during day especially uh, early morning and in the evening and globally approximately 2.5 billion people live in the dengue risk uh, regions with about 100 million new cases each year so india accounts for nearly one third of all dengue cases reported globally and the other major one is chikungunya transmitted by a bite of aedes aegypti again in 2006 more than 1. 3 million people were affected by chikungunya virus which prevailed across 150 district of eight states in india so about japanese encephalitis it's caused by japanese encephalitis virus je was first recorded in vellore and pondicherry in mid 1950s transmitted through zoonotic cycle between mosquito pigs and water birds as we already uh, uh, saw and uh, vector is Uh, culex uh, uh, mosquito and it incubation period varies between 6 to 16 days and the clinical finding of fever rigors headache and vomiting and encephalitis syndrome like difficulty to uh, difficulty uh, to uh, i mean uh, speak and ocular uh, palsies uh, hemiplegia quadriplegia tremors uh, altered uh, sensorium convulsions and coma 
Chikungunya fever is caused by chikungunya virus and transmitted by the bite of uh, Aedes aegypti. The clinical findings uh, uh, are fever, chills, anorexia, conjunctivitis, uh, uh, morbiliform rash or trunken limbs, uh, coffee colored um, vomitus, uh, epistaxis, and petechial hemorrhage. Prominent symptoms in adults is uh, orthopathy pain, swelling, stiffness of the metacarpophalangeal uh, uh, joint tissue, uh, especially the wrist and the uh, elbow, uh, shoulder, knee, ankle and metatarsal joints. Diagnosis is uh, through serum uh, in the first three to four days with PCR or any other uh, uh, biotechnological or molecular uh, uh, technique. Uh, and uh, treatment is through symptomatic and uh, mosquito control measures uh, are the only prevention because there is no vaccine available for chikungunya. Am I audible to all? Hello? Yes, sir, audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. So the other important uh, uh, zoonosis is leishmaniasis. It's a complex disease caused by a protozoan caused leishmania, Jonawani. And in India, endemic in uh, uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, and UP. Manifest in two forms, cutaneous and visceral. I'll show you some pictures in the next slide. And transmitted by the bite of female uh, uh, phlebotome sandfly. The clinical findings are fever, splenomegaly. I mean, swelling of uh, spleen and uh, uh, liver is uh, hepatomegaly. Anemia, weight loss, and darkening of skin of the face, uh, 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 hands, feet, abdomen, and... Uh, lymphadenopathy. So the picture on your left, a man with a lot of uh, 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 bulging on there, uh, uh, on his uh, head is nothing but uh, lymphadenopathy plus uh, um, uh, darkening of skin with uh, a lot of lesions on the cutaneous tissue. And post colas are dermal leishmaniasis is the typical uh, uh, lesion uh, uh, developed even uh, uh, consisting of multiple nodular infiltration of the skin. Uh, and usually there won't be any ulceration uh, documented in these uh, post colas or dermal leishmaniasis. And as I said, there are two uh, different uh, uh, forms. One is cutaneous leishmaniasis, is painful ulcers in the part of the body exposed to uh, sandfly bites, uh, legs, arms, or face. And uh, bone marrow and spleen tissues are uh, uh, best aspiration uh, samples for diagnosis. Staining methods are also used, and classical blood agar, uh, uh, triple and medium consists of 0.6 percentage NACL added to a simple blood uh, agar uh, uh, slope, the most currently used to media. And visceral leishmaniasis is diagnosed through uh, PCR assay, uh, uh, is almost 100 percentage sensitive using uh, peripheral blood. Ults, uh, ultra sensitive PCR assay for visceral leishmaniasis is also uh, is a very good uh, uh, um, uh, biotechnological uh, tool. Uh, other serological tests like IFAT, immunoenzymatic technase, and uh, uh, IAH and immune blots are also used. And uh, easy test or direct agglutination test, RK39 immunochromatography, uh, dipstick, uh, uh, latex particle agglutination, dot ELISA, and fast ELISA are very uh, uh, commonly used to diagnostic test for visceral leishmaniasis. The other one is all parasitic. Tinea cis and the cysticercosis, again caused by two parasites, Tinea saginata, uh, uh, if we are actually consuming undercooked or uh, uh, poorly cooked beef, and Tinea solium is the uh, host animal of uh, uh, pig, and uh, when the undercooked or poorly cooked pork is consumed, then uh, the Tinea solium uh, get transmitted to um, uh, through the food to human being. And the Stenia solium is endemic in India, widely reported. Uh, and uh, Stenia saginata, I mean, the uh, beef based uh, uh, parasite was uh, moderately reported. And uh, if the infected uh, meat was uh, ingested, uh, and even the water and vegetable contaminated with the ova or egg of these parasites will also. Uh, um, uh, the reason for the transmission of the disease and the cysticercosis refers to tissue infection after exposure to egg of tinea solium and the pork uh, uh, tapeworm. Toxoplasmosis again caused by a parasite called uh, Toxoplasma gondii and it is primarily uh, the definitive uh, 
uh, host of uh, cat, I mean our domestic cat, and transmitted by uh, infection by ingestion of the tissue cyst present in the raw or undercooked beef, lamb or pork, uh, lamb or pork and uh, ingestion of oocyst from soil, water, milk or vegetable. Toxoplasmosis uh, present worldwide with uh, zero positivity ranging from less than 10 percentage to over 90 percentage. Zero prevalence in India is about 22 percentage approximately. It can be transmitted congenitally in pregnant mothers. So the pregnant ladies have to be very careful with their pet cats. And another form is acute toxoplasmosis, the swollen lymph node. You can see on the picture the retina is completely ruined because uh, uh, it affects um, uh, the uh, 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 retina and uh, it necrotizes the tissue and it creates a necrotizing retinochondroitis. And skin lesions, uh, rosea and erythemia, uh, multiform uh, like eruptions and urticaria and uh, uh, maculopopular uh, papular lesions you can see on the baby's body all over. Yeah, with this, I am going to conclude my presentation with a short summary of there are almost 70 described zoonotic diseases in the world. It continues more than 60 percentage of all it constitutes so more than 60 percentage of all the infectious disease affecting humans. The major 13 zoonotic disease alone kills 2.2 million people in a year. Three out of four emerging infections coming from animal. There are multiple and complex set of challenges to zoonotic disease control in India. And public awareness is also very important. Ways to prevent zoonotic disease from a CDC uh, web page was personal hygiene and self-discipline. Keep your hands clean and prevent bites from mosquitoes, ticks and fleas. Love your pet and beware of zoonotic diseases. And eat food and water safely. Avoid bite and scratch from animals. Existing public health systems and newer framework or opportunities to further the agenda of zoonotic disease prevention and control. Establishing partnership between academic and implementing agencies, also a major uh, um, factor that we can uh, easily uh, get away with this kind of pandemic and get a better understanding about this uh, uh, pandemic. So with this, uh, I would like to refer some of the articles which I have uh, uh, taken help from and acknowledging uh, all these people and a lot of uh, web pages and uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank even uh, uh, Arosha India for giving me this opportunity and uh, thanks to the whole autonomous St. John's uh, St. Joseph's uh, College and the Department of uh, uh, Zoology for extending all their uh, uh, cooperation and uh, very disciplined way of listening the lecture. Thanks again. Thank you very much, sir, for that very informative talk. The house is now open for the discussion. Kindly uh, click on the raise hand symbol so that we can be able to surface your questions to the speaker. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Shall I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Sir. Am I audible? Yeah, I am. Yes. Go ahead. Sir, I'm Kiran Mai Pinagund. I had, uh, what, what is the, is there any relation between zoonosis and uh, blood groups or races of human? No, uh, there was no proven record of uh, um, uh, the blood group and uh, zoonosis. And, uh, there no can I ask another question? Yes, ma'am, yes. please. Um, what is about this unsymptomized, uh, unsymptomized uh, human? How can we, I mean, uh, that is uh, if the, they are uh, the actors yeah, yeah. passing the diseases to other uh, uh, healthy person, then exactly. how it will be controlled, isn't it? That, that's, a, that's a big challenge in our COVID-19 uh, situation, ma'am, because uh, as I already said, isolation and uh, quarantine is the only answer for all these problems, because uh, uh, as long as we... Uh, have our own self-discipline for maintaining the hygiene and uh, uh, making use of all these uh, gadgets or the gears to uh, avoid contacting or <laughs> people. So, uh, according to my uh, understanding, 
except your own family members until or unless if they are going out you should always treat everyone as a non symptomatic carrier only then we will achieve eradicating this pandemic otherwise it is very difficult you never know and you can't follow everybody's uh, travel stories and then their mobility so uh, you are right that we have no clue about the non symptomatic carriers now you may also be a, a non symptomatic carrier i may also be a non symptomatic carrier we never show the disease and sometimes we never even show the disease uh, forever because as i said if you are if, if your immunity goes down then you are prone to establish the disease in your body otherwise uh, there is some other uh, term is uh, popularly uh, spoken about as herd immunity is nothing but if you get minimally exposed or adequately exposed we can't even quantify that if it is 5 gram of virus 10 grams of virus uh, pardon me for my statements but uh, if your exposure is adequate for your body with your adequate immunity and if you don't have any other morbidities like uh, as i already said hypertension or uh, diabetes or hiv or any other uh, heart disease or kidney diseases then definitely your body will get over the problem and then you will naturally produce immunity so uh, i don't think i have answered your question but according to my understanding we can't figure out the asymptomatic or a non symptomatic individuals especially in covid 19 cases so that's the big challenge we are facing that is why this arogya uh, app will also be a very useful tool that if you can just uh, start making the entries and then make sure that we are following our own mobility patterns and where are we Uh, uh, traveling and whom and all we are meeting so it's very important that is why uh, uh, a simple word of uh, self discipline in terms of maintaining relation hygiene and uh, uh, using the uh, um, uh, protective gears are very very important am i audible may i ask another question sir yes. yeah uh, uh, are we I'm considered really these pathogens or the- okay hello yes ma'am yes ma'am louder yeah uh, are we considered these junos junos pathogens that are created or evolved only in wild environment <laughs> maybe it is looking uh, like a silly question no 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 ma'am not at all not at all but i mean uh, if i understood your uh, question correctly you want to Uh, no, all these zoonotics are from animal origin or not, right? No, sir. Uh, your... But they are evolved from wild environment because all of these uh, viral uh, members are coming from wild Diseases. environment. Yeah. Are they created there? Uh, I mean, I don't think so, ma'am, because uh, many diseases have got a long history. So. Um, i mean obviously uh, uh, we are also uh, barbarians at one point of time so uh, it might be true but uh, many at times uh, these diseases were uh, uh, focused or even uh, uh, downstreamed while identifying and diagnosis voice breakage hello hello arun sir voice breakage uh, madam i think there is some uh, glitch with the connection we will get back problem from my side uh, no sir you are audible now you can continue check arun sir can you hear me check check can you hear me sir uh dr viola will try to call and connect to dr arun yes sir uh, get back in a while we'll get back in a while uh, i'll try to reach him yes sir sure Viola Yes sir Viola Kumar yes. here yes, sir, the participant of 
after the participants ask the question, ask them to mute their mics. Otherwise, there will be overlapping of sound. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Yes, yes. Um, may I know where exactly I stopped? Or what was the question before? Uh, sir, Madam was asking about uh, uh, the diseases being taken from the wild or not. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So I was trying to say that uh, it was obviously many diseases were actually uh, studied and then uh, got into the bottom of the uh, problem. And when they diagnosed, many of them were evolved from wild environment. So, which is very obvious because we never carry uh, pathogens when we bore. So that's the main uh, school of thought. And the other side, uh, even in this particular case of COVID-19, they have uh, studied the genetic uh, uh, breakup or uh, they, they sequenced the entire virus which has happened in Wuhan. And then they have actually uh, tested or cross-matched with the Indian uh, pathogen, but it was matching 99%. So when, when it keep mutating, and if they are evolving from one uh, uh, sequence to another sequence, that means uh, mutation of any kind, you will never uh, know or find the origin of the problem. So it was as of now considered or even uh, believed that many of these pathogens are from wild origin. Yes, sir. Thank you. We have a question from the YouTube live Thank chat. Miss mm -hmm. uh, Varsha Singh asks, uh, sir, do you agree about uh, the spread of pandemic COVID-19 due to consumption of animal meat? Uh, uh, I, I don't agree fully because uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, meat eaters. I mean, uh, if you consider the percentage of meat eaters, uh, there are many. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, it might have originated from the wet market of Wuhan, but uh, uh, in, in our case, in India, when you talk about in India, is it because of the uh, meat consumption? I won't uh, agree fully because it's all man to man uh, uh, transmission happens. So uh, in that case, uh, no vegetarian should uh, get the disease. So uh, I partially agree with your uh, statement. Uh, I don't know whether it is convincing to you or not. Definitely convincing, sir. Thank you. There's another question from Ms. Deepika Singh. She asks that if the current scenarios of pollution is making us more susceptible to the disease by decreasing our immunity. Yes, absolutely. All our man-made uh, idiotic stuffs, whether it is a misuse of plastic or uh, uh, pollution, and even though there are steps available to go on to your third floor of your apartment, still using uh, uh, elevator, or uh, when you go to the mall, you look for an elevator or a um, uh, escalator definitely increases the uh, pollution or uh, decrease or use of uh, fossil fuel creates a lot of issues and you must have very well witnessed in this uh, time that many rare animals were started uh, roaming and then crossing the road and people have sighted a lot of animals in their localities just because of less pollution so uh, there is no doubt in it that as long as uh, we respect the natural resources, we will have to face this problem. It is not only pollution, so many other things, including our exploitation of the resources and uh, not bothered about uh, segregation of waste and uh, uh, overwhelming uh, 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 throwing of wastage and many a times uh, tying the pack of uh, waste and throwing to the next compound, thinking that my house is clean, so all these concepts put together will bring our immunity very, very bad. Because as you know that a lot of landfill in tons a day, I mean in 10,000 uh, uh, tons a day in major cities and ocean pollution, plastic usage, all spoils the topsoil and that definitely affects the plant life on the planet and then that eventually comes back to us only. We always think the planet is only for us. That's a major problem.
Yes, sir. Thank you so much. The next question is from Dr. M. V. Balasubramanian. Uh, good evening, sir. Hello. Yes, audible. Uh, Arun, sir, are you with us? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, the next question is from Dr. M. V. Balasubramanian. He asks if zoonosis is temperature dependent. No. So one of the myth buster also I have mentioned that cold climate or hot sun is going to kill the corona and then I can roam around everywhere. So zoonosis is nowhere related with temperature. Okay, sir. Thank you. Anybody in the Microsoft uh, Teams group wanting to ask a question, please raise your hand so that yes. I can direct you to the speaker. Yeah, ma'am, please. Shikha yeah. Koshik this way. Yes, please. Uh, Uh, good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you yes, are audible. Yes. So I have two questions. Uh, yeah. My first question is that uh, we know the tribal communities are very far in connection from modern human civilization. And even a small fragment of uh, common cold can cause a devastating damage to that particular population. So as field workers and uh, forest officers, what preventive measures on individual level we should take so as to prevent the transmission of diseases from humans to that particular tribal community? Any, any zoonotic stuff. I mean, as I said, uh, some of the zoonoses like KFDs are actually originated from uh, ticks when they uh, infect the monkeys. So. It's all uh, depends on the different kinds of uh, uh, zoonosis. So that is why there is not a single solution. It's like conflict mitigation only. There is no single solution for controlling your conflict. So it depends on the disease. It depends on the mode of transmission. It depends on the community and their level of interaction. So it, it, it's a complex uh, 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 situation, man. So I don't have a definite answer for you, but as long as... Uh, uh, we keep distance, something like some of this uh, pandemics or uh, uh, air or even uh, droplet or sometimes uh, uh, fomite uh, transmitted diseases. So you should avoid contacting them and uh, you should uh, avoid them coming outside their original habitat. So uh, they will be uh, kind of quarantined within their environment and there won't be any external uh, influence uh, for them to get the disease. So. Uh, I don't think uh, it's a difficult situation as long as the uh, people from the forest department or anybody, any other non-governmental organization staff working with the tribal or even the protected area has to maintain their own self-discipline. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. I have uh, one more question, please. Yes, please, yep. sir. Uh, sir, as we know that uh, the buffer zone uh, in today's time is decreasing because of uh, increasing human population settlement. Right. So what preventive measures we should take, like uh, if we get back from forest as a research worker or field worker, so what measures we, we should take that uh, to restrain the contamination of particular disease by carrying it from forest to the human settlement or particular cities? Yeah, uh, it's a uh, brilliant question, but only thing is, uh, as long as uh, uh, we are policy makers, uh, I don't think uh, we will get a convincing answer for this question, because uh, uh, as we all know that when we are talking about some developmental issues and many people, even in Banargata Road, because I live in Banargata, so many companies uh, uh, beyond sometimes in Jigini or in Kotigare, they won't get the permit because they are close to Bernargata National Park. But when you are talking about reducing the buffer, I don't know where from our ideas changes. And if somebody is not getting the permission to run their factory in Jigini, because they are close to Bernargata National Park is one theory. On the other side, we will be shrunkening the buffer area of the National Park. So I don't see any, uh, uh, I mean, uh, sense into it. So uh, as you rightly pointed out, it's all as a researcher, try to avoid uh, getting into uh, the buffer area because the research is primarily permitted buffer or outside buffer area only. The uh, uh, 
intrinsic uh, side. I mean, just outside the buffer, there is a zone, so you can very well restrict your activities and try to educate people that the core and buffer areas are really important because uh, core area has got a lot of endemic plants and animals. And then when you're talking about buffer, that will have uh, a lot of uh, human settlement of tribes and other uh, local communities. So we should retain those stuff. So that is the main reason uh, uh, the government or even UNESCO coined a word called biosphere reserves. So as long as we understand the, uh, the classification of the forest or even the quadrants of the ecosystem, uh, uh, it it's, it's definitely makes a lot of uh, uh, difference to the buffer zone. So we should restrict our expectations of development. So only then uh, uh, we can prevent uh, such kind of uh, strengthening of buffer uh, zones. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yes, the yes, next sir. question is from Dr. Putul Banerjee from St. Joseph's College. Ma'am, you can unmute and ask. Thanks, Viola. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you yes. are. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very, very nice presentation and covering almost all aspects of zoonosis. My question is, uh, when you consider the different microbial agents, pathogens like uh, virus and bacteria, and considering that uh, virus has to enter the cell to cause infection and all bacteria does not require to enter cell, what do you think is the relative uh, chances of uh, bacteria and virus jumping species from animals to uh, humans? Uh, or do you uh, see it in statistics? Sorry, ma'am. Can, can you repeat the last sentence? Uh, statistically, do you see any difference uh, in the propensity of a bacteria and a virus jumping from an animal species to human species? Uh, I don't have a, 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 a data set or even a research publication for this, but uh, in my understanding, based on all the uh, uh, zoonotic uh, uh, disease activities, because uh, invariably, many uh, zoonoses are animal involved and being a vet, uh, we will always study about the emerging and re-emerging and then uh, um, neglected zoonoses. Uh, as you have pointed out, there are a lot of virus, a lot of viral pathogens are uh, uh, in the environment, but almost 80 to 90 percentage of them are common cells. I mean, they won't, they, they easily get destroyed because they need the uh, living being and most of the time they are uh, uh, getting uh, uh, mutated or sometimes uh, that mutation will only make them not to survive for a long time. So it's a kind of self-containment by nature that many viruses are not actually uh, become zoonotic. So I feel uh, when uh, compared to virus and bacteria, uh, the bacteria are in number. There are several viruses uh, present in a human host, when you're talking about animal to human or uh, the environment to human, a human through vector or intermediate host. Uh, but I feel uh, the statistic for viruses is really low. But even if it is one or two, they end up in pandemic instead of uh, zoonotic. So that's why uh, we need to give uh, adequate respect to viral diseases. But in terms of numbers, I uh, always uh, for, uh, right, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you, sir. The next uh, question is from uh, Mr. Karthik Gokhale. You can ask the question, sir. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Karthik Gokhale, this side. I wanted to ask uh, with the decrease uh, decrease in the with the expansion of uh, rural areas and agricultural lands. We are uh, closing to the wild uh, more and more. So, how does the the, this contact of the livestock or the humans with the wild animals affect uh, affect the disease propagation. Yeah, it's an, uh, are you done with the question? Yes. Sir. Yeah, Hello? yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, you are absolutely right, and it's a very emerging problem because uh, there are multiple. Ex Examples I can say, but I'll tell you one uh, a beautiful example of gir uh, lions got canine distemper from domestic uh, animals. So 
it's really a raising concern and uh, it should not happen because as we all know one of the endemic species of india is asiatic lion or indian lion so if we lose that prestigious population and then we are uh, we are actually stupid so that is why uh, it's not only the carnivore i am telling uh, anthrax brucellosis foot and mouth disease uh, canine distemper and then several other diseases are just jumping from domestic animal because uh, uh, in many at many uh, places i mean uh, the previous uh, uh, student was asking that the buffer area and core area so buffer area is allowed for grazing fishing and uh, 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 limited human interaction in uh, reserve so Uh, when you are actually talking about these zones and then uh, 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 improper or uncontrolled uh, 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 interaction between uh, the wild animal and the domestic animal there is lot of uh, chances and possibilities of uh, getting infected uh, uh, from the domestic animal so it has to be stopped and then we have to make sure that uh, uh, the laws are really uh, in place and uh, the wildlife protection act very well talks about uh, grazing and uh, Uh, restricted grazing in some of the protected areas so but implementation as you all know is really bad in our country so we should all uh, take some initiative and make sure that we will report to the uh, respective or concerned authorities that if there is anything uh, going wrong in the forest so that is that is how we can participate containing these kind of zoonosis we can't we can't all the time blame the government or expect the government only to do all these things according to your uh, um, Uh, ipc every individual every individual has got the rights and then every citizen is responsible for your country's development so you have to take responsibility oh yes thank you sir the next question is from the youtube live chat uh, mr era sureshi asks if being asymptomatic has something to do with our genetics or is it just the immune status of a person So as such, there was not much studies happened on this uh, uh, genetic uh, background of this disease transmission. But uh, till now, everybody believes it is just uh, uh, based on your immune system, as well as your other morbidity factors. As I already said, chronic kidney diseases, uh, blood pressure, or uh, sugar, or any other heart issues, automatically you will be under stress, and then that uh, compromises your immunity. and you are very uh, good candidate for the coronavirus to jump in yes sir uh, the next question is posed from ms maria anjum um, she asks if uh, during the presentation the lower latitude countries were told to be hot spots for zoonosis uh, she wants to know what the reason is and is it because of the temperature yeah the lower latitude is actually there are a lot of studies uh, happening on that front but uh, lower latitude is just because of the temperature as one of the factor but not exactly because uh, uh, if you consider any of this pandemic including uh, uh, even uh, um, uh, uh, malaria uh, it it is nothing to do with the temperature but uh, sometimes if there is any vectors involved in it i mean if there is any intermediate host or reservoir host involved in it so that makes lot of difference so uh, on on top of it again the population and the uh, level of mobility and our uh, uh, living standard also makes uh, uh, a kind of factor uh, to create such kind of uh, hot spot so uh, but there are uh, continuous studies going on that uh, why these hot spots were uh, uh, specific to some area so uh, as on now i i, I can only Uh, uh uh give you few uh, information on it yes sir thank you um dr neetu bk assistant professor from jyotinivas college has a question uh, she asks do invertebrates or vertebrates um sorry which are more prone to the vector the vertebrates or the invertebrates and if so what is the reason mm. that's a nice question but it's a difficult question to answer uh, but uh, there are 50 50 percentage chances because uh, uh, there are some uh, zoonotics uh, primarily depending on uh, invertebrates and uh, some of the uh, vectors are uh, uh, 
definitely a, a, a invert, a, not, a vertebrate uh, species. So it, it again depends on the mode of transmission, what the pathogen selects. So uh, I don't have a definite answer, ma'am. I'll, I'll definitely uh, get into the bottom of the information, but I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Param has a question. He asks, sir, what is your opinion on the disease spreading from stray dogs to wild dogs and cattle to ungulates in the forest fringe areas? Yeah, uh, if you are asking about my opinion, uh, it's, it's very, uh, very, very uh, limited because uh, only in certain part of our country this happens. That is also because of uh, a little bit of uh, unmanaged stray dog population because uh, there are several non-governmental organizations working on ABCs, I mean uh, animal birth control program. So uh, it's part of the animal birth control program that all the dogs, especially non-owned or stray dogs were vaccinated. So if someone is again doing their job properly and perfectly, then there is no need to worry about it. And uh, wherever again, wherever people fails, I will tell you, it's a simple concept, wherever people fails, what you have supposed to do is always getting into trouble. So it is all because of man-made. I, I can give you a simple answer that as long as we are not having our own self-discipline and then respect other life and then make sure that, okay, I supposed to do this. That is how I have taken this profession or I have taken this job or I have taken this uh, uh, task. Kindly abide by it. So when we always ignore some of our own responsibilities, we are ended up in some problem and then we always try to blame or find excuses to push that problem to someone else. So that is what it's happening. But otherwise, I agree that uh, the canine distemper episode in uh, um, uh, our uh, Gir National Park is just because of uh, stray uh, dogs or uh, the uh, dog has contracted the disease to uh, wild animal and uh, some other places, even the angulates get the disease uh, like uh, FMD primarily and black quarter. So such diseases are definitely from the buffer zone or even the fringe of the forest where the domestic animals were uh, uh, allowed to graze uh, without any proper uh, measures or control that transmits the disease. So uh, I partly agree that uh, some of the diseases uh, uh, are getting transmitted from the domestic uh, counterpart to a, a wild animal. but. If the, if the forest is well maintained, if the animals are not uh, allowed or uh, were uh, not, um, uh, I mean, expected to come out, then uh, these. Aishwarya Yadav, please mute. Yes, sir, please continue. I've done with my answer now. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I'm in complete agreement with your answer. Uh, Mr. Kiran Sai asks, uh, if we are talking about sanitation as a solution, aren't we increasing the chances of creating antibiotic resistance? Yeah, one way it is true. One way it is true. Actually, honestly telling, being a vet uh, uh, in the past, uh, using sanitizers frequently, I mean, even if it is once a day, uh, I was always against that because uh, it kills a lot of good bacteria from your skin. Okay. And I always tell even my uh, wife also not to apply so much of cosmetics on your face because it kills. And washing the face frequently may be, uh, make you pretty, but it is definitely going to be a very harmful procedure for all your microbes because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I have done my... Uh, uh, PhD program in gut microbes. So uh, I always respect microbes. Okay. So uh, your uh, answer is very much correct, but we don't have any other choice now. It is between uh, your life and the microbes life. So whichever is the best, the choice is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Karthik Gokhale, you can please unmute and pose your question. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, my question was, uh, can you explain some reasons or peculiarities which make, uh, which could make a bat such perfect course for carrying certain virus strains? All right. Um, 
number one is I don't have much knowledge about uh, bats because uh, I'm not a, a bat specialist. And number two, whatever I understand about bats, just because of their metabolic rate, the virus are very much uh, choosing the host. So that that's one word uh, answer. Whatever I know and I understand about uh, the relation between the bats and uh, uh, the viruses. So apart from that, uh, I may have to read a lot to answer your questions, man. I'm very sorry. Okay. Uh, I I also had one more question. Yeah. Uh, can I ask? Yes, please. Yes. Do you have uh, any answer for the previous so, question? No, I was uh, searching for answer that what makes bats so special. All right, all right. So if you yeah. find any uh, interesting answer, please let us know. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, you, I have your email ID. All right. Cool. Yeah. So uh, my second question was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you mentioned about the uh, stupidity of humans. Yeah. What limits? What limits should we have to set for ourselves, even for exploring or exploiting or extrapolating the to the levels of development we do? Uh, I mean, according to my limited understanding, I'm 45 year old. I can't talk philosophies, but still, you made me to talk now. So, point number one is avoid your greediness. Please accept whatever you have. It's a very simple fact when we always look for something else and you always compare you with somebody else to grow bigger and bigger, earn bigger and bigger is not going to come along with you, man. It's a very short life. Everybody has to understand that. Don't secure money for five generations down the line. You please give them some resources, make them uh, uh, earn money, give them uh, good education, make them aware about the uh, environment and ecosystem and the biodiversity make them connect with the nature that is very important then all the time running behind money and they they always think money can make everything definitely not and then that is what promoted everywhere you click this link you will earn money people are jumping into click the app with no uh, common sense so what are you going to do with a man one day there are a lot of uh, philosophical talk when when the last fish was fished and then eaten by a man and then they will realize that I can't eat my money right so it's a simple yeah. uh, build of energy and then try to utilize that and then learn a lot of good things I mean uh, yogis are really uh, intelligent and they, they know how to deal with the life and how to deal with your body and then now we are completely disconnected with the body forget about nature we never know about our own body. First understand sure. that. What is wrong in that? Because of your body you are living. So, uh, I am very sorry that I have to give you some philosophical answer for this because uh, no, uh, there is no amazing. limit for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely there is no limit for stupidity. Every day's, every day's action of yours has to be reviewed. If you review it, is it really good for the nature or is it really good for my neighbors and friends? Also is important factor. Don't think all the time, is it good for me, good for me, good for me. Then it's all turned to be become, it's benefit for me, benefit for me, benefit for me. So we all uh, travel towards that direction and not even realizing the, the fact that this is a short life and whatever you earn, you are not going to succeed. And when you realize about the nature and connect with your body, you are about to die. What is the use of this day? Please be real and then make sure that that has to be forwarded or even uh, inculcated uh, inculcated in somebody, some kid's mind. So you should not be a bad, ex a bad example to anybody else. So if you True. try doing that, I feel, I feel that I, I think we can achieve something here because you, you should not give up. That's my only request. Don't give up. Yes, never. Yeah. Thank you very much. It Thank was you. a Hello. answer. Thank you, sir. Hello. It was very well put that nature provides for our needs and not for our greed. Uh, with, exactly. this, uh, uh, with this, with uh, this, we will uh, hand it over to Miss uh, to Dr. Kavya for the vote of thanks. As uh, we are ending this uh, this talk or this uh, webinar in a few minutes, 
uh, all the others who have questions or have any discussions with uh, Arun sir can reach out to him. Uh, his email ID and phone number have been displayed uh, on the shared screen. You can please reach out to him. Uh, over to Dr. Kavya. Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Viola, ma'am. Yes, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please continue. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Kavya, Assistant Professor from Department of Zoology, St. Joseph's College. First and foremost, I would extend my thanks to the organizers for this giving me an opportunity to render the vote of thanks. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to the speaker of the session, Dr. Shah Harun, Director of the Research of the Veterinary Operations Wildlife SOS Bengaluru, for his insightful session on the need of the earth, that is the zoonotic diseases, Thank you very much, sir, for your patience, deliberation and making us aware of this zoonotic diseases and making us a very uh, aware of this particular topic. I also thank Dr. Viola for moderating the session. Thank you for leading the session, madam. Mm -hmm. I extend my thanks to all the participants who were actively involved in the webinar and made this session a successful one. I also thank the beloved colleagues from the Department of Zoology for their active involvement in the webinar. Last but not the least, I thank my very own students for making this possible with their tireless efforts. Thank you, dear students. Without you, this was not possible. I also thank the Almighty for making this national webinar on the wildlife trafficking and zoonosis jointly organized by the Natural Science Association from the Department of Zoology as well as Arosha India, a successful one. I thank many thanks to the organizers, Dr. M. Jai Shankar, as well as Avinash for taking it up. And we also look forward for such webinars in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all, for making this possible. Thank you. Over to you, Viola, ma'am. Uh, I would like to add, add yeah, uh, Dr. Viola, with your permission. Yes, sir, please, please continue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is again uh, in continuation of uh, expressing our gratitude to the speakers. Uh, we are thankful that uh, all the three speakers, Ms. Jayanti Kalam, uh, Mr. Joe's yesterday and uh, Dr. Arun today. Uh, all their talks were interesting and uh, apt to the title on wildlife trafficking and zoonosis, a topic very much required, uh, very much the need of the art. Uh, I am thankful for them, uh, thankful that they have uh, actively participated. Uh, they spare their time to be with us and to enlighten the participants who have registered from different parts of the country. I should be thankful. I got, this is time to thank the management, St. Joseph's College, uh, for encouraging us and supporting us in organizing this national webinar. A big thanks to Arusha, especially Avinash, Senior Research Officer Arusha, uh, in uh, collaborating, bringing out this three-day national webinar on wildlife trafficking and zoonosis. My colleagues in the department and my HOD, Professor Thomas P. Zakaria, thanks to each and everyone for making it a successful uh, webinar. Uh, last but not uh, the least, the Natural Science Association and its volunteers. This would not at all have happened, I, and I'm underlining it, if it were not to be to the efforts of uh, Soumya Rachel, Anukriti, Alan, uh, Abrajit, Jeffen, Sri Lakshmi, Lochana, Kishore, Ajay. These uh, pillars of this webinar, they have done every groundwork behind the screen. Uh, thanks to all these volunteers, student volunteers, for making this a great success. Thanks to all the participants from different parts of the country to have actively participated in this webinar. The feedback form will be shortly issued, mailed to you. Please respond and these certificates will be issued to those who have attended all three sessions, all three days. That's the condition we had put when we sent the invitation. Uh, thank you. Over to Dr. Biola. Jay, Jay, Shiv Kumar here. Can I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Biola. sir. Yes, sir. Biola. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Please continue. Uh, adding to everything, I would like to appreciate the participants for their very disciplined approach and their calm attitude to listening to all the three speakers. We should not forget this kind of a disciplined participation, the participants in these three day webinar. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone, from my side and for a patient uh, uh, listening. And I would really uh, appreciate uh, the entire uh, management faculties on behalf of uh, Wildlife Fisheries. And uh, thanks to Avinash Arosha for giving me the opportunity to interact with all of you. And it was a wonderful session. Thank you so much again. All the very best to all the students. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vyola, they can, uh, the participants can leave. Uh, that, that, that's how it comes to an end. Thank you very much for your participation. You may exit this meeting and good night. Good night, John. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you and good night. Good night, Pat. <laughs>